Greetings! This is Chapter 38, Thyroid, Parathyroid, and Adrenal Disorders, and this is Professor Lombard. So, in this chapter, we are going to be talking about certain endocrine organs. So, I want to briefly go over some of the aspects of endocrine regulation. So, you have two major ways of communicating in the body. The nervous system is the fastest, and then the endocrine system um, is next as far as speed goes. So, you have the thyroid and parathyroid and the adrenal glands, and they are examples of endocrine glands and organs. Remember that your endocrine gland is able to release hormones into the bloodstream where they travel to target cells and they bind and they cause change. And that means then that by going to the bloodstream, they're going to be able to affect, if they have to, many, many different cells and different organs if need be. Um, now, you have to control these cascades of endocrine organs and hormones and we do it by negative feedback and that's what is something that the body usually does um, meaning that if you had an elevated heart rate you would have feedback and the feedback would lower the heart rate so negative really means opposite so if hormone levels become too high then hormones can feed back and lower the amount that is released. Um, so again, remember that negative feedback produces the opposite effect. So high hormone levels can feed back and result in the lowering of the hormones in order to return the system, the body back to homeostasis. So here we are with the thyroid gland and we're gonna start with the thyroid gland first. So the thyroid gland is located at the base of your throat. So it's called a butterfly shape. And here's your butterfly. So you have your right and your left thyroid. It's right below your voice box or larynx. And there are a number of hormones that are made by the thyroid gland. T3 and T4. T3 is triiodothyronine and T4 is thyroxin. And they are primarily responsible for the regulation of metabolism. But they need iodine in order to function. So very often um, people might say, oh, this individual is really thin and they can just eat all they want and they don't have to exercise and they're really thin, so they really must have a very overactive thyroid. Uh, when they're saying that, what they're talking about are the two hormones, T3 and T4, being overproduced, which makes the person's metabolism really kicked up, and that's the reason for why they're saying what they're saying. The other hormone, however, doesn't have anything to do with metabolism as such. It's calcitonin, and calcitonin is all about regulating blood calcium levels. So if there is, let's say, absorbed from food, a lot of calcium, then the blood calcium would be elevated. And what would happen is that would give feedback to the thyroid and they would secrete calcitonin, which would be able to try to retain but store, like in the bones, uh, the excess calcium. We are going to emphasize in this particular chapter the effect of the T3 and the T4 on metabolism. We're not really going to talk that much about calcitonin. Okay, so I'd like to get into the regular, normal regulation of the thyroid hormones of T3 and T4 in the negative feedback loop, and then we can talk about what's happening in diseases and that's a typo but that's okay all right so normally you have the hypothalamus at the base of your brain 
and you have the anterior pituitary. And they are going to start a cascade that will then activate the thyroid gland. So we start with the hypothalamus. It's going to secrete thyroid releasing hormone, or TRH. And the thyroid releasing hormone's target is the anterior pituitary. When it binds, the anterior pituitary releases thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH. Important hormone is important as far as the diseases go, it's important for diagnostic. So thyroid stimulating hormone ends up stimulating the thyroid gland, specifically to release the hormones T3 and T4. So T3 and T4, uh, as far as, you know, stimulating metabolism, it can also control, help control body temperature, help the body burn calories, control how fast the food moves through the digestive tract, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, we've got that feedback loop, hypothalamus, anterior pituitary to the thyroid gland, and then the hormones do their thing. If you don't use those hormones, there's a shift in metabolism, there's a shift in activity in the person, then those hormone levels could get to be high because they're not being used that's when you're going to get the negative feedback loop. You can also have a situation where it's not making enough T3 and T4 and the levels are too low, and that's also going to feed back. The whole idea is that since it comes from the hypothalamus and then the anterior pituitary and then the thyroid gland, if you want to jack it up, you're going to jack up the amount of hypothalamic thyroid releasing hormone, and then you're going to elevate the anterior pituitary making thyroid stimulating hormone and then those elevated levels especially TSH is going to mean that the thyroid gland is going to respond by making more T and T3 and T4 and it's going to be the opposite um, if the levels are, are you know too high then you want to feedback and have them be lower so with this type of feedback you get these negative feedback loops you should have always homeostasis meaning the same you should have the same t3 the same t4 if it goes up you want to feed back so it goes down to homeostasis if it's too low you want to feed back and get it elevated to get it back to homeostasis so here we go negative feedback loop the levels become too high they feed back to reduce the amount and then uh, the process is going to be reversed and then we'll get to disease. So this is showing you a normal feedback mechanism. Um, so here is your hypothalamus, sorry about this, your hypothalamus and your pituitary gland. And what's happening is that hypothalamus produces TRH, and that affects the pituitary anterior. That produces TSH, goes via the bloodstream down to the thyroid gland at the base of the throat, and then that stimulates those cells to produce T3 and T4. The levels of T3 and T4 carefully regulated, and if it gets too high, you want to lower them, and if it's too low, you want to raise them. Okay, disorders. One thing that is diagnostic of a problem with a thyroid is a goiter. And a goiter can be a swelling at the base of the throat. So the swelling can be either the thyroid is overactive or it's underactive. And in both cases, for different reasons, you end up having fluid accumulate and that causes the goiter or the swelling. The goiter comes in two forms you can have nodular goiter. Now that would mean that you would actually be able to palpate that goiter and to feel these little lumps um, uh, or nodules. The other type, if you were palpating it, would you wouldn't feel the nodules, but it would be swollen. And that generalized swelling is called diffuse goiter. You can find goiters typically in three case scenarios. 
one hypothyroidism seen in iron deficiencies. Uh, iodine, not iron, iodine. Iodine deficiencies um, are or happen in areas um, in the world where iodine is not readily available. Uh, in the United States, back in the turn of the 20th century, there um, were areas of the U.S. where see, iodine is found in the ocean. So sea water, sea weed, fish. And if you were in the Midwest, then you probably um, had an iodine deficiency. It's absolutely essential to have iodine in order to make T3 and T4. Otherwise, you don't make T3 and T4. And if you don't make T3 and T4, then that's going to affect your metabolism. So the solution was clever. Um, salt, which very often comes from removing water from seawater, they added iodine to it. So iodized or table salt has iodine in it. So it meant that everyone in the United States, if they use table salt to salt their food, then they got their iodine. So it didn't matter if you were in the middle of nowhere where you would never be exposed to a source of iodine. You got your iodine. You, your thyroid made T3 and T4 and your metabolism was fine. Uh, but worldwide, we still do have places where they don't have access to iodine and there is deficiency and it's hypothyroidism because you can't make T3 and T4. All right. In the U.S., because we have iodized salt, we don't have that. But we have people who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis and people who have Graves' disease. So that's what we're going to talk about next hypothyroidism. An example is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Hyperthyroidism can be seen in a different disease called Graves' disease. That's a goiter. So um, that's swelling at the base of the throat. All right, thyroiditis, which means inflammation of the thyroid. So what is kind of a typical example of thyroiditis is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And we'll talk about Hashimoto's thyroiditis in a wee bit. We're first going to talk about Graves' disease. So that is hyper, too much, hyperthyroidism. And Graves' disease is autoimmune. And what the immune system does and again, it's kind of idiopathic. We're not really sure, blah, 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 blah. But the immune system starts to see the thyroid stimulating hormone as something it wants to uh, mimic. So this autoantibody is designed to have the receptor on the cells of the thyroid think it is thyroid stimulating hormone that's been released from the anterior pituitary. But guess what? It's not. So you're getting this autoantibody and it's binding to the TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone receptor on the thyroid cells. And when TSH does normally do that, the thyroid cells are going to make T3 and T4. But now you have an autoantibody not TSH hormone that is mimicking it and is binding and the thyroid cells cannot tell the difference. So they will respond by making way too much T3 and T4 and that is what causes the hyperthyroidism. Now as much as uh, we're not getting into too much signs and symptoms and treatments, I do want to go into the test. It's a very simple blood test, but the reason why I want to do it is I want to have you understand um, the feedback loop and then how the feedback loop is altered in disease. 
So in this particular case, if you suspect a person might have some sort of a thyroid problem, you're going to draw blood and you're going to measure the levels of the hormones in question. So if you took a blood sample of a person you suspect has Graves' disease, you're going to find that there is a decrease in the actual hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, but an increase in the levels of the hormone that the thyroid would make T3 and T4. Why? That has a lot to do with the fact that if you have another mimic, like your autoantibody that's mimicking the TSH, then the feedback of the high levels of T3 and the high levels of T4 is going to then dampen down the amount of TSH that the um, anterior pituitary is going to make. In other words, the anterior pituitary gets the signal from uh, itself and the hypothalamus that says, oh my God, T3 and T4, they're so high. So what we should do in the feedback is to lower the amount. So you're going to have the low releasing hormone, low thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, of course, the pathology is not with the hypothalamus, not with the anterior pituitary. It is with a autoantibody autoimmune disease. So as much as the body's not producing a whole lot of TSH due to the negative feedback, the autoantibody, which is being regulated by the immune system, is still making a very high amount of the autoantibody that mimics the TSH. So that's why that blood test is so valuable. It's easy to do, uh, it's relatively inexpensive, and it will just tell you immediately that this person is making too much T3 and T4, um, and that it's not because of thyroid stimulating hormone. And then you can follow that up and then measure to see if indeed the person is making this very specific autoantibody. But you can do that simple blood test first, and that will give you a kind of an idea of what's going on with the individual, and then you can follow it up later with imaging and other types of blood tests that might that would pick up on the autoantibody. And next. All right, so as much as I don't want to get too much into clinical science and symptoms, if, uh, because a lot of them make sense, if you have a very active metabolism because you're making way too much T3 and T4, then that person is going to be metabolically just really very high, burning a lot of calories, perhaps losing weight. Um, and you're also going to get that kind of super excited hypermetabolic type of thing. So the tachycardia, perhaps atrial fibrillation, goiter. Now the stare. Um, if you look at pictures of people who have Graves' disease, they almost look like they have bulging eyes. And that um, is kind of a tip off as well that the person might have Graves' disease. And needless to say, um, they are perhaps a little bit on the nervous side which could be a lot of things. So that's the reason why the blood tests will really narrow it down. Okay, opposite. The opposite of hyperthyroidism is hypothyroidism, and that's Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, these diseases very often are named after physicians who first describe and publish. Okay, so it is also an autoimmune disorder, but it's very different. Um, what happens is that the immune system is going to make autoantibodies, but the autoantibodies, along with T-cytotoxic cells, destroy. They are going to kill the cells. They are going to target them, bind to them, and the T-cytotoxic cells are going to come in and do cell-to-cell um, combat and they are going to totally destroy them. So a person who has Hashimoto's thyroiditis is slowly but surely having the their immune system destroy their thyroid gland. And the more cells that are destroyed, the less T3 and T4. So 
what the feedback is going to be. So the feedback for the hypothalamus and for the anterior pituitary is like, oh my God, T3 and T4, the levels are really, really low. So what is going to happen? And it's just easier to measure TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, and that's what they do. So they take a blood test and the anterior pituitary says it's too low. So I have to make more and more and more of the thyroid stimulating hormone in order to get the low levels of T3, the low levels of T4 back to normal. Problem is that there's no way that thyroid stimulating hormone is going to help the cells that are slowly but surely being destroyed. They can't be replaced and because of the autoimmune aspect of the disease where the autoantibodies target the cells and the T-cytotoxic cells destroy them. That's the reason why the low T3 and T4, which of course the feedback mechanism cannot repair that immune system disorder. A simple blood test will tell it all. So what will happen is you will see in a person that you suspect might have Hashimoto's thyroiditis that their T3 and T4 hormones are quite low because they're destroying their thyroid. And the TSH, however, from the magnificent anterior pituitary is trying its hardest to stimulate the cells that are left to produce more T3 and T4 by jacking up thyroid stimulating hormone. Very easy to pick up. So you have very high TSH levels, very low T3 and T4, and that will be very indicative of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And then you can do further tests. Now, the thing about the Hashimoto's thyroiditis is something that I do want to mention. Um, if you have very low levels of these very important metabolic hormones, then obviously people can feel very weak, fatigued, lethargic. You can have muscle soreness, cold intolerance. You also can have a goiter. And because you don't have very high levels of these metabolic hormones, you can gain weight. The next one is something that uh, I'd like to emphasize. And that has to do with depression. Sometimes hormonal imbalances can give you physical symptoms and sometimes they can also give you um, kind of emotional symptoms that uh, have to do more with the psychological rather than the physical. And an amazing 15% of all clinical cases of depression are eventually found to be attributable to Hashimoto's thyroiditis. We don't understand the mechanism. We don't know exactly why low T3, T4. We don't know whether it's an immune component because it's an autoimmune disease. Um, certainly individuals who are hypothyroid because they don't get iodine in their diet don't get depressed. So that's perhaps a lot more complicated, but it's one of the things that goes hand in glove. Now, the thing about an individual who is slowly but surely having their immune system destroy their thyroid gland, they're going to have to be on hormone replacement therapy for the rest of their life. I'd love to tell you that we have a way of stopping the destruction. We don't. So the person is tested to see where they're at and then their hormone replacement therapy is adjusted during the course of the destruction of their thyroid gland. Okay, there are very rare, but there are cancers and the different cell types within the thyroid gland can have malignant transformations. And what I really want you to realize is that for the most part, they're rare. They're kind of hard to initially diagnose because the signs and symptoms of things like fatigue and muscle soreness or you know low metabolism could be due to so, so many things. And very often people kind of knee jerk to, is it iodine deficiency? Is it Graves disease? Is it Hashimoto's? And 
they'll do all the tests and if all those tests come out negative then they will probably image and see if there's a tumor there uh, the good news however is that most of these either papillary thyroid or follicular thyroid or medullary thyroid or anaplastic thyroid they tend to be slow they tend to not do this broad metastatic event um, if they metastasize they tend to metastasize the different cells in the in the um, try again the throat so that's the good news uh, and uh, the one that is perhaps the most dangerous is the anaplastic thyroid cancers um, they're aggressive aggressive tends to mean that they're going to grow fairly quickly and that they could metastasize so this is just saying they're very rare few symptoms and what do you do the easiest thing to do is to remove the thyroid gland especially since metastasis is rare and then that person would have to be on hormone therapy for the rest of their life but then they don't have to worry about the cancer spreading um, and that tends to be what uh, is the most successful all right we're gonna then leave thyroid and we're gonna go to parathyroid parathyroid are four little groups <clears throat> excuse me um, of tissue that is hormonal in nature that lie underneath the butterfly of the thyroid gland and they make different hormones and they have their own set of disorders so the one that is the most common type of imbalance of the parathyroid glands is hyper so hyper parathyroidism so what does the parathyroid gland actually what do they make they make a hormone called parathyroid hormone and parathyroid hormone is going to be elicited when for example um, serum calcium levels are very low uh, etc etc so let's go through this laundry list of the normal function of parathyroid hormone so if blood calcium levels are low parathyroid hormone will get released and it will cause the bone to release calcium and so the calcium that is in the uh, calcified area of the bone can then be broken down and you release the calcium to the serum and then the serum calcium levels get back to normal um, understand kind of tuck in the back of your mind that serum calcium levels are essential because there are many activities of nerves of cardiac muscle skeletal muscle smooth muscle that depend on serum calcium and to be able to access that so that's the reason why you always want to have homeostatic levels of serum calcium for those types of functions so parathyroid if the levels get too low kick in and raise that calcium level because you can store excess calcium um, in bone for this type of situation uh, parathyroid hormone can also cause calcium to be taken into our blood from the small intestine so if you eat a meal that's very high in calcium then you can readily absorb that calcium from the small intestine into the blood and parathyroid hormone can help it can stop the kidney from getting rid of calcium in our urine if you have low calcium levels you don't you do not want to have your kidneys take more calcium out of the blood and to have it excreted in your urine you want to reabsorb it you want to keep it you don't want it to go into urine production and parathyroid hormone can help you with that now parathyroid hormone can also stimulate the production of vitamin D in a form that is needed to absorb dietary calcium in into our blood so 
vitamin D, which you can take as a supplement or get out in the sun and expose uh, yourself to sunlight, um, that will, via the kidney, get into an active form that then can move to the intestines. And that then can bind and promote the movement of calcium in food after it's been broken down and then make it much easier for it uh, to move into the blood. Now the last one is a little bit tricky. Uh, it, causes, it causes the kidneys to excrete phosphate in our urine. So I'm going to read the next sentence and then explain it. Since too much calcium phosphate, now calcium phosphate is something that you can find as a calcified salt in bulk. Um, and a lot of times uh, phosphates like in uh, sodas like Coke or Pepsi um, can elevate phosphate. Um, and this is the thing you don't want to have happen. You don't want to have so much phosphate and so much calcium combining to form these crystal-like complexes because these crystal-like complexes of calcium phosphate can block blood vessels, it can cause heart disease, it can cause stroke. So if, for example, you drank a lot of soda and uh, also had a good dietary source of calcium, then you have a situation in the blood where the calcium levels are high, the phosphate levels are high, the last thing in the world you want to do is to have both of those be high and form crystals and start to block your arteries and and uh, have a thing like a heart attack down the road or um, problems with your heart and problems with a stroke. So this is the brilliance of parathyroid hormone. What it's going to do is it's going to allow via vitamin D to have the calcium go into the blood, but it's also then going to tell the kidneys to excrete the phosphate reabsorb the calcium, excrete the phosphate. And that way, the phosphate levels are going to be low in the blood, calcium levels are going to be high in the blood, and that is going to inhibit any crystals forming. So you're not going to have the blockages. So it's a brilliant hormone. Um, you need it for so many things, but you need it especially if the serum calcium levels are low. Okay, so here's your parathyroid gland. A little one, one, and a two, and a three, and a four underneath the thyroid. Okay, so hyperparathyroidism is really what can be problematic. And that's going to mean that you're making too much parathyroid hormone. There are three types, primary, secondary, tertiary. So let's go over each one. Primary hyperparathyroidism is going to be a parathyroid gland that becomes enlarged and is overactive. It makes obviously too much parathyroid hormone. Um, and that can be idiopathic, and it can happen for no apparent reason, but if you make too much parathyroid hormone, then can you imagine, it's gonna to start to leach out a lot of the calcium from the bone, it's gonna weaken the bone, you know, it's, it's like a lot of things, but you're going to have the disorder be such that feedback mechanisms are not gonna solve the problem. So the gland releases too much of this PTH, and you've got very high levels of calcium in the blood. And very often, they get the calcium from places in the body like the bone. Now, a cause that we do know about is a benign tumor. And it's called an adenoma. And the, that means that you don't have a malignancy. And it's not going to metastasize. And yet, you're going to have to remove that adenoma in order to remove the cause of the production of too much PTH.
Now, let's go from primary to secondary. So, secondary hyperparathyroidism is caused by other diseases, not an adenoma, not idiopathic, is other diseases or deficiencies. So, what are they? Um, some of the causes of low level of calcium in the blood is chronic kidney disease. Now, we'll get into kidneys in a couple of weeks. So, I will get into homeostasis of calcium levels by the kidney at that time. But when you do have chronic kidney disease, it does start to reduce the levels of calcium in the blood. Now, a lack of vitamin D. Again, we take vitamins or we get out there in the sun. But in my grandparents' day, when multiple vitamins <laughs> was not a thing, and consider New England, uh, and there are times when about the only part of your body that gets into the sun is your face. Um, you could develop a disease brought about by low vitamin D called rickets. And that would affect the child's skeletal system so that their skeleton is not as well developed. And the rickets kind of, uh, one of the things that would happen with a child developing and, and not getting a lot of either calcium in the diet or vitamin D is they would have bowed legs and their legs would kind of bow out and that would be one of the signs that everyone could see that the child had um, deficiencies growing up and that the bowed legs was indicative of rickets. Okay, so that's secondary hyperparathyroidism. It's brought about by other types of diseases. Now, tertiary. This type of hyperparathyroidism occurs as a result of long-standing secondary hyperparathyroidism. People with chronic kidney disease, that unfolds in years, decades. And that is obviously long-standing. So if that long-standing chronic kidney disease as it unfolds over a long period of time can have an effect on the parathyroid gland uh, or something like vitamin D and rickets so that it's abnormal for such a long period of time that the parathyroid gland, that it actually will never come back to normal. Uh, the function of that parathyroid gland has been compromised for such a long period of time that even if um, things change, although it probably is not going to change with chronic kidney disease, you are going to have a situation where um, the parathyroid gland uh, is not ever going to get back to normal. Now, hypoparathyroidism is quite rare. And the most common in the U.S. is surgery. So let's say that someone had cancer of the thyroid gland and they surgically were going to remove it and there was a whoops. And by accident, they ended up removing some of the parathyroid glands and that person, because they had the surgery for the thyroid cancer and it was a surgical mistake, and they perhaps eliminated two out of the four patches of parathyroid, then that person is going to be hypoparathyroid. That's the most common. Um, now, if that happens, you can see that that person is going to have um, some consequences of that. Hypocalcemia and hypophosphatemia are two consequences of that. And if your calcium and your phosphate levels are both down, that can cause muscle spasms. All right, we are next going to go to the last set of endocrine organs for this chapter, and they are the adrenal glands. The adrenals lie on top of your kidneys. 
and there is a cortex, an outer layer, and an inner layer or medulla. The cortex is complicated. It has three areas. It has the zona glomerulosa, the zona fasciculata, and the zona rectularis. And then you have the middle of the adrenal gland or the medulla. Um, we're not going to talk too much about the adrenal medulla in this particular chapter. So I just do want to mention that the hormones in the adrenal medulla that are made by the cells of the adrenal medulla are epinephrine and norepinephrine, mainly, and a small amount of dopamine. Also, again, tuck in the back of your mind that in the United States, we talked about those hormones as epinephrine and norepinephrine. In the rest of the world, like Canada and Europe, they will talk about adrenaline and noradrenaline. Uh, they are exactly the same thing. Adrenaline is epinephrine, noradrenaline is norepinephrine, and just had to mention that. All right, so the next slide has to do with the adrenal cortex and the three layers. And uh, here we go. This is a histological depiction of the three layers. Uh, here's your kidney. Here's your adrenal gland lying on top of it. Uh, the outside is um, the, the cortex, and this is the medulla. So your um, zona glomerulosa makes mineral corticoids. And the most famous of them is aldosterone. We'll talk a lot about aldosterone when we do the kidney. And aldosterone is responsible for balancing out electrolytes in the blood. So it is going to regulate minerals like sodium um, and potassium. More about that later. The zona vasculata is going to make glucocorticoids. And they are going to regulate glucose metabolism. Remember. The level of glucose in blood is critical. You want it to be homeostatic. You don't want the levels to be too high or too low. You want it to be just right. And so the regulation of glucose metabolism, the hormones that are responsible for that are cortisol, cortical, I'm sorry, cortical cortisone, hello, and um, that's, I'm sorry, cortisol, um, cortisone, and cortisone. Then, uh, and we will talk a lot about cortisone in a sec, or cortisol in a sec, because it has such an effect on the body on so many levels that either if the levels are too high or too low, there are problems. Then we have the zona reticularis making androgens. Now, the androgens are sex hormones like testosterone and like estrogen. So testosterone, then we're going to uh, use that as an example of stimulating masculinization. And testosterone and estrogen are a tweaking of cholesterol. And so a source of cholesterol is absolutely essential um, in order to make these sex hormones, especially testosterone. And then the adrenal medulla is going to make the epinephrine and norepinephrine, they're your fight or flight or fight uh, hormones, and they are going to um, be regulated and stimulated separately. So let's get into pathophysiology. So a primary adrenal cortical insufficiency is Addison's disease. Now, in Addison's disease, what is happening is that you are going to be making too little of um, the hormones uh, that are made by the adrenal glands, the cortex. So how and what actually happens? One of the major dysfunctions in Addison's disease is an autoimmune reaction. 
the immune system sees this 21 hyd hydroxylase as foreign or different. Now, the problem is, is that when the autoantibodies are made against this, this enzyme, it ends up destroying the cells of the adrenal cortex. So that is more prevalent in the United States. Now, tuberculosis is not, thank God, that prevalent in the United States. You do have TB, uh, racist, ugly head with people who have AIDS. Um, other than that, it's fairly rare. So it's not going to play a big role in Addison's disease. But the thing about TB is that it does have a very immunosuppressing um, effect on the body as it progresses. So that immunosuppression can also uh, indirectly lead to adrenal suppression because there is that link between stress and the adrenal glands. Uh, and if you uh, end up compromising the immune system because of TB progressing, that's how it gets implicated in Addison's disease. But thankfully, TB is not that prevalent in the U.S. And so Addison's disease tends to be this autoimmune, autoantibodies to this enzyme, which ends up destroying some of the cells of the adrenals, of the adrenal cortex. Okay, so it's a long, Addison's is a long-term endocrine disorder in which the adrenals do not produce enough of a steroid hormone like cortisol, and that is going to lead to too little cortisol being made. Now, signs and symptoms, um, if you start to look at these, they could be due to a lot of different things. So that you're definitely going to have to have a blood test to see the person's levels of cortisol to give you a tip that is Addison's disease and not something else. So you've got abdominal pain, you've got weakness. Sometimes people do have hyperpigmentation um, because of Addison's disease, not everyone, and weight loss. So one of the things that you don't want to have happen in Addison's disease. Uh, and if it's undiagnosed, it can happen. If there's a huge stress event, that can also be a trigger for what is called an adrenal crisis. And that means that there is suddenly a severe lowering of the adrenal hormones, specifically adrenal cortex. Now, the hormones um, are essential for a lot of different things and one of which is blood pressure. So that if all of a sudden there's a crisis and a crash in the levels of the adrenal cortical hormones, it can reduce blood pressure to a very critical point where the person could lose consciousness. And it's easy enough to remedy. You can inject person with cortisol and they're gonna be fine but you want to make awfully sure that it's not happening in a situation where they can't get to an ER, uh, they can't get to a place where cortisol would be readily um, made available and injected and get that person out of that adrenal crisis. People can die of this. If it comes on suddenly and they don't get the cortisol replacement quickly enough, that crash in blood pressure can lead to a loss of consciousness and the person can die. Um, and that's the reason why Addison's disease is a hormone replacement therapy and has to be continued for the person's entire life. Okay, so I thought cortisol was important enough um, for either, you know, too little, too much, to talk about what it actually does normally. So this slide is more of a uh, review. And if it's not a review, then absolutely suck in all this information. So it's a steroid cholesterol-based hormone. It's also used as a medication. And that's going to be a segue into the last disease state that we're going to talk about in a bit. Um, and we use hydrocortisone 
sometimes as a cream to put on in inflammation in the skin. And we can also use hydrocortisone or cortisol uh, to treat certain symptoms of certain diseases. So it can be used topically and, you know, external, internal. Now, cortisol is a normal response to stress. And the other normal response and the releasing of cortisol is if you have low blood glucose. Cortisol normally increases blood sugar. And we'll talk about the liver in a bit, but the liver can break down glycogen into glucose, release it into the bloodstream, and you're all set. The other thing about cortisol is this. It suppresses the immune system. Immunosuppression can be something that you want to invoke. You may want to have an anti-inflammatory reaction in the body. If you want inflammation to be tamped down, the body will stimulate the adrenal cortex to make more cortisol. That can be very appropriate. Where you can start to run into problems is if you have a person who has an autoimmune disease and they're in a crisis and you want to suppress the person's immune system so they don't make so many autoantibodies. That's when the person might receive injections of cortisol. And that, over a period of time, you can have kind of like a tiger by the tail. You, you can start to then over-immunosuppress the person so that they can almost become like an AIDS patient and also have other types of disorders start to crop up. But the person's between a rock and a hard place. Their autoimmune disease is killing them. The high levels of cortisol to suppress the immune system may also kill them. More about that later. Um, the other thing is that cortisol can also aid in the metabolism of fat, protein, and carbohydrates. Okay, it can also act as a diuretic, increase water flow from the kidneys, as well as retain sodium and get rid of excess potassium. Now, in Cushing syndrome, the levels of cortisol are um, abnormally, uh, try again, high, and so you end up having pathologies. Okay. Um, I am now going to get into Cushing syndrome, which is the next slide. So, if Addison's too low, Cushing is too high, and how does this happen? It's called a syndrome because cortisol controls so many different things in the body, which is the reason why I had you go over that slide that we just left. Um, it has so many effects. It has effects on blood glucose. It has an effect on the immune system. It has effect on the kidney. It has effect on fat metabolism, protein metabolism so forth and so on. So it has a lot of effects on the body. So if it's too low, like in Addison, you have certain problems. If it's too high, as in Cushing, you're going to have other problems. In the case of Cushing's, um, it could just be due to the fact that a person might have an autoimmune disease. They're given way too much cortisol in order to control that autoimmune disease, and then bam, they've got Cushing syndrome, which is because they're taking to or they're taking in via their medication for controlling a totally different disease, way too much cortisol, and that's going to trigger Cushing. Another are going to be these benign adenomas because you do have your hypothalamus and pituitary also trying to control the adrenal glands through ACTH, adrenocorticotrophic hormone, they can end up, if they have benign tumors like adenomers, start to produce 
too much of their releasing hormones, stimulating hormones, and that ends up jacking up all of the adrenocortical all adrenocortical hormones. So if you have a benign adenoma in the anterior pituitary, then that can really increase adrenal cortical trophic hormone and that would end up affecting the adrenal cortex that would end up producing too much cortisol and that person would develop Cushing's. Another type of adenoma can actually be in the adrenal cortex. So this benign tumor starts to grow in the adrenal cortex and the result of that is to increase the amount of cortisol and the person comes down with Cushing's. Let me show you this last slide if this is, there we go. So this is a person with Cushing's and this could be because they're taking too much medication and their cortisol levels are too high because they're taking in too much probably because of an autoimmune disease or some sort of inflammatory chronic disease that they're trying to control any sort of crisis. Um, obviously, if that happens, the way to treat Cushing's in that particular case is to try to reduce the amount of medication. If it is a benign tumor in the adrenal, I'm sorry, the anterior pituitary, it's a benign tumor. If the gods are good, you can surgically remove it. If it is a benign adenoma in the adrenal cortex, again, hopefully you can surgically remove it. Then the cortisol levels go back to normal and all of these signs and symptoms can be reversed. But if you notice uh, the person is overweight, there's a lot of fat deposits in various parts, that has to do with the effect of cortisol on fat metabolism. Um, you can also end up having a bloat in the face uh, as well as a bloating in the entire body. But mainly if you look at the person with Cushing's, most of the fat is deposited in the core of the body, not as much in the arms and the legs. And that's just the peculiarity of where cortisol tends to work. Um, because cortisol also affects water retention, then too much is going to give you too much water retention. So the person is going to retain that water and that is going to really cause a lot of bloating of the body, of the face. Um, since cortisol also is involved in regulating blood sugar, the person can end up having high blood sugar, the retention of water could be high blood pressure. So when you go, I don't want you to memorize all of these, um, but to realize that when you've got too much cortisol, you, because it controls so many aspects of um, fat deposits, it affects how much water you retain, it's going to affect the immune system, is going to cause immunosuppression um, and so forth and so on. So that is the it's kind of the physical aspect of Cushing disease. The person then, if you can start to lower that cortisol, all of this can be reversed. So that is the end of this chapter. And thank you very much for listening. And that's the end of chapter 38. Thank you very much.